Welcome back. So after a few weeks of review and anticipation, we will start diving in this week and in this lecture um, to the actual historical developments, both social and political developments and some of the linguistic developments um, of the times before English. So focusing on Proto-Indo-European and Common Germanic and some of the things that sort of led up to what happened before English became a language. So the things we'll cover today are the social and political history of Indo-European, what little we do know about the people during that period of time. And then we'll start looking at the linguistic history of what took us from Proto-Indo-European into Germanic languages as a whole, um, and looking at those times before English. Um, and we'll focus on things like morphology, syntax, semantics, some of the more grammatical aspects of the linguistic history today. So if we start with the timeline, which was in a previous lecture, this is just kind of a review for you, um, and goes into a little bit more detail of the times of Indo-European and of Germanic. Indo-European is seen as having been spoken from maybe around 5000 BCE to about 3000 BCE, um, where there was a linguistic unity during that time. Um, and then around 3000, maybe a few hundred years before or after, um, Indo-Europeans began to spread out across Europe, across Asia, Around 1000 BCE is when the original European language is seen as having split into different language groups. It's no longer seen as Indo-European as a single language any longer. Um, it would now be the different sort of proto-forms of Germanic or of Greek, etc., etc. Um, and then around 700 to 900 or so BCE is when the Celts made it to the British Isles and began settling those areas. And it's around that time that we see the period of language known as Germanic take place. Um, and so the Germanic things to keep in mind during this time frame, Germanic as a proto-language would have happened several hundred years before we really have a lot of documentation of it. But looking at the relevance to the British Isles and what leads up to English, around 55 BCE is when the Roman raids began and the occupation um, within a hundred years of that of Britannia of the British Isles by the Romans. Um, and then in the early 5th century is when the Romans left the British Isles, so the early 400s. And by 449 is when the Germanic tribes had come in, defeated the Celts, moved them off to the edges of the Isles and onto the um, island where Ireland currently is. Um, and this is seen as the beginning of English. It's no longer um, controlled by Celts, it's no longer controlled by Romans, which had different language uh, subfamilies from Indo-European. Um, and so this would be when the Germanic languages really took over in that area and had isolated themselves from other languages to allow English to begin. So if we think about what we do know about Indo-Europeans in this early period of time, the earliest written records we have only date to about 1500 BCE. So there's not a lot of written records of Indo-European um, prior to that period of time. So the other information that we have, as we've looked at in previous lectures through reconstruction, what we know about Indo-European prior to that is through historical reconstruction, through comparative methods um, and finding those different pieces. And generally, most scholars agree that there was a common Indo-European language spoken possibly as early as 5000 BCE and likely as late as 3000 BCE when the different branches of settlers began to move and go into different places across Europe and Asia. The little that we know about the people themselves, the sort of social and cultural aspects of their the people is that these were a late Stone Age people. Some of them were likely semi nomadic, so some of them may have had some sense of settlements, but there were a lot of there was a lot of movement around. But we do have evidence that they had domesticated animals by this point. They had primitive levels of agriculture, so they might have been somewhat nomadic, but some of them had some aspects of actually growing different crops. And they had a fairly well developed religion by this period as well. But there's still a lot of uncertainty as to the kinds of things that they may have looked like, whether or not they were from the same, quote, racial stock. I put this in quotes because we know that race is something that is socially constructed in many ways. Um, so this is the idea of if they were coming from the same sort of genealogical background or if they were in, from different sort of groups that happened to be intertwined with each other. Thinking about some of the cultural and language aspects, what we do know about where they would have started comes somewhat from the language itself. So modern day Indo-European languages have shared common words for things like cold, winter, honey, snow, beach as in the tree, and pine. 
but they don't have common words for things like ocean or palm or elephant or camel. And so the results of this and thinking about what these languages have in common leads us to an assumption that they were likely inland people in a relatively cool area. So the Caucasus Mountains in um, Eastern Europe or Western Asia is where the most likely um, location was for the Indo-European people at the beginning. This is not something that is completely set in stone, but this is something that is based on the evidence that we have so far. Although relying only on surviving vocabulary could be dangerous because there are ways that we see what seems like common vocabulary but isn't. Um, so for instance, robin and oak are words in American English that refer to very different species than what um, exist in Europe because the colonists named them after they look like and not the actual historical relationship between them. So American robins are actually a type of thrush. They're not even the same kind of family as the English robin. So they're very different, but they looked similar when um, settlers got to America. And so this is where we get some of those crossover in terms. So it looks like the same vocabulary, but the sources and the actual reference points are slightly different. And sometimes common words can be lost from individual languages. So surviving Indo-European languages, the ones that we still see today, don't share a common word for sky, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't a concept of sky in Proto-Indo-European. There likely still was, but it would have changed more drastically than some of the other shared common words that we find. So just because there is or isn't common words doesn't mean that we have all of the information. Some of the archaeological information that is available has identified what's known as the Kurgan culture of the region um, north of the Black Sea with early Indo-Europeans, but there's no written records, there's no real proof of this, but historically this matches with some of the linguistic evidence, some of the surviving vocabulary, um, and some migrations that are known as Kurgan invasions have been seen as a source for the spread of these Indo-European languages. But this isn't always something that is accepted. More recently this has been called into question um, because scholars are trying to seek some understanding of the motivation for migration. So if they were around for a few thousand years in this one area, what suddenly motivated them to start spreading into other areas? And this is something that we're still not entirely sure of. So archaeologists are now looking for different kinds of cultural evidence, cultural changes, to try to show some of the motivation for these different dispersal episodes that they're called. Um, and this can help give information and evidence not only to Indo-European as a language family, but other language spread as well. So what motivated the language spread in other language families. And some language families we might have more information than others historically. As we look at the spread from Indo-European into Germanic, by around 3000 BCE is when those migrations began sending Indo-Europeans from their origins all throughout Europe and into Asia. And possibly as early as 2000 BCE is when groups reached Greece. So this is one bit of evidence that Greek um, and uh, Hellenic languages have sort of split off sooner than several others. Um, by about 1500 BCE is when other groups would have reached the Indian subcontinent. And there's not really a lot of information on on exactly when other branches may have split up. Um, but generally, the time frame of around 3000 BCE is listed as the end of common Indo-European, and then the time frame of about 100 BCE is the time frame listed for the end of common Germanic. So Germanic would have been from around that just um, sooner than 1000 BCE period of time up until around the time um, just before the Romans made it to the British Isles um, as the end of common Germanic. And if we look at some of the major changes that we'll talk about and that we'll see, there's a lot of different linguistic characteristics that set Germanic languages aside from other Indo-European branches and other Indo-European languages. And we'll focus on several of them in this lecture, and then we'll focus on the phonology and the sound system in the next lecture. So starting with lexicon, we'll look at some of the ways that Germanic languages are unique in terms of their lexicon. We'll look at a lot of different aspects of morphology, and in these early stages of linguistic development, in the Germanic stage, in the Old English stage, we're going to have a lot of aspects of morphology that will be important to look at and important to understand. So we'll look at some things like case markings, some different verb inflections, what verb classes existed, some of the uniqueness of Germanic languages with their adjectives. We'll talk a little bit about semantics and meaning, and then in the next lecture is when we'll get to phonology because a lot of the changes um, happen in phonology, so there'll be an entire lecture devoted specifically to that.
So if we think about some of the things with the lexicon, the words that we find, Germanic languages are often distinguished because we have a large common vocabulary amongst Germanic languages that isn't found in other Indo-European languages. So there's a lot of words that exist among Germanic languages that don't exist in other branches of Indo-European as uh, common um, to each other. So this is where there's evidence that it sort of may have split off developed some of its own lexicon and had time to develop that as common Germanic before these other Germanic languages split off. They also inherited a lot of words from common Indo-European, from Proto-Indo-European, uh, and these tended to be the most basic words that human cultures have. So if we think of that Swadesh list when we were looking at historical languages, these are the kinds of words that you might expect to find that are common not only to Germanic, but also to those other branches of Indo-European. So things like kinship are words for father and mother. Some of our most basic verbs like be or lie or eat. Um, things like natural phenomena like sun and tree. Some of our very common adjectives like long or in Indo-European languages, the color red, which is not found in all languages. And then just body parts, things you'd expect everyone to have, things like foot or head. So there's a lot of lexicon that Germanic languages have in common that's unique to Germanic languages, but there's also a lot of evidence of its relationship to these other Indo-European languages, especially through these very basic words as well. And we can see evidence of other kinds of borrowing as well that happened during this common Germanic period, where even before it had split off into other Germanic languages, even before it had split into English, there were some borrowings from other branches that were found as well. So things like Latin um, had already begun, begun to influence the language with words like copper, ark, cheese, kettle, ass as in the donkey. Um, linen are words that we would have borrowed during common Germanic that aren't originally Germanic, but we can trace back to Latin origins. And also some Celtic words um, such as king and iron that would have been brought into Germanic before English became its own language. So we can base it on some of the sound changes, some of the um, other linguistic changes that can sort of give us a better sense of timing for when these words were borrowed in. And these were some of those very early ones. Some of the morphologically um, complex aspects of going from Indo-European to Germanic um, show that there was a lot more morphology previously than what we have today. So inflections in Indo-European were much more complex than other forms of English and especially other than present day English. In Indo-European, there were four major word classes. So nouns or adjectives, these were not really distinguished in Indo-European because they took the same kinds of inflections. They weren't really distinguished as separate. You could use an adjective as a noun and vice versa. Um, there were pronouns, verbs, and prepositions. But they didn't have all of the word classes that we currently have. So there, there's no evidence of any adverbs, things like articles, things like conjunctions having existed. And most of their words were inflected in a lot of ways. So there were inflections um, and morphology that was associated with nouns, with adjectives, demonstratives, pronouns. And these were all inflected for case, for number, and for gender. And we don't see a lot of those kinds of inflections in modern day English, but these will be very important as we go through the history of the development of English and the history of English. So when we think about case, some of you may have heard of case as a concept. Case itself is a concept that marks or changes the nominal system or the noun system or nouns and adjectives that's used to give us an identification of the syntactic relationship that's happening between different nouns and verbs in a sentence. So in present day English, we're mostly using our syntax order in order to do that. We have to put words in a certain order in a sentence to get the proper interpretation. But in many languages and in Old English and in other early your forms, then you would have these markings instead, these morphemes that would attach that would give you that relationship. And then the ordering of the sentence is less important as a result. So it's likely that in Indo-European, there were eight different cases. Some languages that exist today that aren't Indo-European have even more than that. But we had probably about eight. So the most common ones and the ones that we'll see as we move in through other stages of English as well would have been nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. And then they also would have had what's known as ablative, instrumental, locative, and vocative. And I'll go through each of these one by one as well. So if we think about each of these individually, if we start with our nominative case, this would mark what we would see as a subject of a verb or predicate nouns and adjectives. So most of the time in present day English, we think of nominative as subjects. 
So things like Jack fell down and broke his crown. Jack would be the subject in that sentence and would be a nominative case. But this is also sometimes in copula constructions where the predicate noun or adjective would also be in a nominative case. So if I say she is a teacher, that would be marked for nominative if there was a case system. If I said she is smart, same kind of thing. Genitive is something that typically marks possession. That's really all that's left of the genitive markers in present day English. Um, and this typically modifies some other noun and expresses things like possession, sometimes the source of where it's coming from, or a piece of something, a partition of it. So something like the boy's boomerang, that apostrophe S is how we mark possession in modern day English. And that would be a, a, a genitive case marker. But something like a piece of cake could also fall into that genitive category. Some of the others that we'll also see, things like dative. Dative cases are the indirect object of a verb. Um, this can also be the object of prepositions, the object of some verbs, and this is what we would see in present day English, for instance, when we see these as objects of prepositions, etc. So the queen gave Christopher Columbus a ship. Christopher Columbus is the indirect object here, and so that wouldn't be marked with the dative case in that case. And then we also have accusative. So nominative and accusative are often the two most common ones that you'll see, um, even if they're not always marked in the same ways. But accusative would mark the direct object of a verb as well as the object of some prepositions. So if there is no indirect object and you only have one object, it would, you would expect the accusative case to be there. So Snow White ate the apple. The apple would be accusative there. And so that would be marked with that case in a language that did have case markings. Some of the ones that we won't see as frequently and that um, aren't as common are things like the ablative case. So this would mark separation or direction away from a source. So in present day English, we use uh, prepositions to mark these kinds of ideas. So when we're putting something in a sentence, we use prepositions to convey these concepts that might have a case marker in some other languages. So they walked away from the, the fight. So it's going in the direction away from a source. So even just using the word away um, would give us an indication of this case in how we're constructing that in present day English. A language that had this as a case marker would have some sort of marker on they or some sort of marker to actually link that distinction and that directionality. Instrumental would mark agency or means, so what something is used for, or so something like he hit the nail with a hammer. So we're using again in present day English prepositions to do this. This would be marked onto the noun itself if it was something that had a case marker. Locative, so marking the place of an object. So we do this again with prepositions, so the train is on the track. And then vocative would mark a person that's being directly ad addressed. So if you're talking to someone and you're acknowledging who you're talking to, so hey you, that you would have a vocative marker in a language that used that as the case. So these were the ones that were cases found in Indo-European. So each of these cons the considerations would have had their own morpheme that was associated with that, that would have been attached directly to the noun or adjective in order to convey that relationship. By the time we get to Germanic though, we retain many of these cases, but there's a few exceptions. So we still have our nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative case, but the ablative and the locative case by the time we get to common Germanic has sort of combined with the dative case and is now found is as that sort of object of a preposition kind of thing, um, where the dative case is sort of covering all of that. And they still had the instrumental and the vocative cases. So there's still a relatively robust case system in common Germanic, but it's beginning to get a little bit more simplified as we move from Indo-European into common Germanic. In terms of things like number and gender going from Indo-European to Germanic, in Indo-European there were three genders, masculine, feminine, neuter. Some of you know other um, languages and know that gender as a grammatical construction is something that is very common. So masculine, feminine, and neuter were the three that were there. Indo-European also had three numbers. So in present day English, we just have singular and plural. In Indo-European, they had singular dual, so that referred to only two of something, and plural. So there were three different numbers that were there. And Germanic preserved all three of the genders and all three of the numbers at first. So the dual is lost later on and leaves only two, leaves only a singular plural distinction. So by the time we get to English, we're only having that dual distinction. But at the at beginning, Germanic did preserve all three of those as well. In terms of the things that you might find on verbs, um, things like tense, aspect, mood, 
you're going to notice that verbs in Indo-European are marked for a lot of different things. They're marked for person, they're marked for number, they're marked for aspect or tense, they're marked for voice, so whether something's active or passive, they're marked for mood, which is showing some sort of state of being, some sort of sense of reality. And so when we're thinking about some of these individually, when verbs are marked for person or number, this is things like first person, sing first person, um, and second person, and third person. So we still mark these in some cases in modern English, typically just with our pronouns, but sometimes on the verbs themselves as well. So I am, he is, they are where we have different verb conjugations depending on if it's first person, if it's third person, if it's singular, if it's plural. Um, we, in present tense, we have one just for third person singular, so I walk, but he walks. So there's still a little bit of that in modern English, but it would have been a robust, more um, complicated system in Indo-European and into Germanic. So things, if you've studied languages like Spanish, for instance, all of the different sort of conjugations that you do with verbs would, would show those kinds of things like person, number, tense. When we get to mood, mood is something that's often related to tense, so we often think of as linguists as tense, aspect, and mood as sort of linked together um, because they're all sort of working together in some ways to convey information about the way the verb is happening, whether it's in terms of time, whether it's in terms of completion, whether it's in terms of um, state of being. So Indo-European had several different moods. Um, so there was the indicative, so things that are statements or questions of fact. There was a subjunctive mood that would express will, an optative mood that expressed wishes, and you'll notice those sound a little bit more, they sound similar to each other, um, especially how we think about them today, but those were separate in Indo-European. An imperative, so expressing commands, and then also an injunctive that would express uncertainty. And we retain some of these in Germanic, so we still had the indicative, imperative, and then optative, the sort of expressing wishes, became the one that subjunctive and injunctive both sort of joined in on. And these ones are still around today. We, even present day English, we don't really use the optative or subjunctive mood very often anymore. It's not really taught um, as frequently, but it would be um, if I were you instead of if I was you. Um, would be an example of that. But we still have indicative and imperative moods in how we construct things even in present day English. When we think about voice, voice ha is something that Indo-European had three inflections for. So when we think about voice in present day English, we think about an active sentence versus a passive sentence, and it's the ordering of the words that changes. In Indo-European, they would have marked it directly on the verb as something either active, where the grammatical subject is the agent of the verb, as passive, where the grammatical subject is the patient of the verb, or as something that's sort of middle tense, and I'll give you an example of that in a moment, where it's syntactically active, it sounds like it's an active sentence, but semantically the meaning gives it a passive nature. This is also something that's found with reflexive verbs. And Germanic lost most of this, except for Gothic, which is no longer spoken. And so they started using phrases rather than inflections, which is what we still use today in modern day English. So for example, the soldier was injured by spraying shrapnel would be passive um, because the shrapnel is the, is the actor, the agent in that case, but we switch it and put was injured by and move the order around to give us our passive constructions um, in present day English. Germanic had already started doing this. Um, the middle voice we see occasionally in present day English, but not very often. Um, so the window broke. We don't know who broke the window, but we and the window can't really do anything actively itself, but the window was broken um, would be a more passive way of saying that. Um, and then our active ones are our typical default sentences. In terms of aspect and tense, aspect shows information that is often linked to or thought of as tense, especially in modern day understandings of English. But aspect focuses more on things like completion, duration, or the repetition of an action. So we have some inflection for things like aspect even today in present day English, but you can compare that with something that's just based on time. So inflections that are just based on time would be our tense markers. And a lot of what was once inflected as aspect in Indo-European is now expressed with syntax in present day English and is something that has sort of simplified as time has gone on. So if we look at some examples, in Indo-European, there were several different aspects. So a present day, which is continuing action in progress. So I speak French is something that's currently happening. There was an imperfect aspect. So a continuing action in the past. So I spoke French, so I used to be able to speak French. 
There's an aorist one, which is a momentary action in the past. So I answered the door. This is something that began and ended very quickly in the past. And perfect, which often overlaps a lot with that other one. So a completed action in general. So I answered the door would also fit into that. And then a pluperfect, so a completed action in the past, as in I had answered the door. And then also future, things like actions to come, where I will answer the door. And in Indo-European, each of these was marked as an actual morpheme on the verb itself. Um, and we see some of those still marked in the way that we uh, put things in present day English, but a lot of them were using additional words, we're using additional elements, we're doing it more as a phrase than as a morphological distinction. So by the time we get to Germanic and what continues in Germanic languages is sort of a conflation of the tense and aspect system. And the focus goes from all of these different aspects to instead focusing on tense, which focuses just on time through inflection. So Germanic reduced all of this into just two tenses. So present, which included the future, and then past or past preterite. So our future tense, quote unquote, in present day English, is actually not a tense in the sort of linguistic definition because we're using a phrase to do this and not an inflectional marker like you might find in a language like Spanish. One thing that's also really important about verbs in looking at Germanic and especially going into different levels of previous forms of English are different classes of verbs that existed as well. So one of the defining characteristics of Indo-European as well as Germanic verbs is that there was this very complex class system. So verbs didn't only inflect for things like aspect, mood, person, and number, but also which verb class they belonged to. And there were seven major classes of verbs in Indo-European. Um, and these ones were distinguished by their root vowels. So in the uninflected form, what was the vowel that was found in that, in that word itself? And then what consonants would follow it? Germanic retained these verb classes, and we see that, we'll see that as we move into Old English as well. Um, and they added a category of verbs to this as well. So in addition to these strong verb classes, these different verb classes that we'll see as we move into English um, from Germanic, they also added a category that was known as weak verbs, or what we would call dental preterite verbs. And our weak verbs are where we get most of our past tense today. So weak verbs were formed from these other word classes and were characterized by having a past tense ending that had a dental preterite, so a T or a D ending. So our ED endings as our past marker in present day English is a sign of these weak verbs, which are becoming more and more common in present day English. So this is a change that's been going on for thousands of years and continues to mold as we move through present day English. So walk to walked, Xerox to Xeroxed would be examples of that preterite or weak verb class. And then the last morphological part we'll briefly talk about the adjectives. And adjectives were something that Germanic did some things differently than what most other branches did. So most branches of Indo-European had a general tendency to try to simplify the um, inflectional and declensional system. So what is actually inflected onto particular words. And Germanic was unique among these Indo-European languages in that they maintained what Indo-European had of two different classes of adjectives. So there was what was known as weak and also strong adjectives. And Germanic maintained these two different sets. And we even see this in some Germanic languages today. So this was determined by whether an adjective had a demonstrative, so a, de a, de a definitive marker, so something like the or that, for instance. And that would be considered a weak adjective, or if it didn't have that and was indefinite, what we would mark with an A or an AN. Um, and that would have been the strong adjective. And we see examples of this in modern day German as well. So a strong or indefinite one, you see that there's different markers, there's different morphemes on the, um, on the demonstrative itself that signals the case. So you don't have to put anything onto the actual adjective because it's marked already in the demonstrative. But for these weak or definite um, ones, then you would have the demonstrative and then you would have the sort of simplified case system on the adjectives themselves. So the adjectives in the indefinite ones would signal the case unambiguously and then the definite ones would and would have slightly less complexity because there's those different articles that are giving you that information. And then finally, in terms of the different grammatical aspects going from Indo-European to Germanic, in semantics, over those several thousand years between 
Proto-Indo-European and Germanic, we can expect a lot of meaning changes to happen as well. So in, in addition to all these grammatical changes, some of the meanings of different things would have changed also through time. And we can make comparisons through documented languages um, rather than just the historical definition of words because we don't have necessarily the historical definitions of words between these um, different languages. But we can see through context of what is written, we can see through context of present day languages that are more similar, that some words would have changed their meanings and expanded from similar meanings to become more distinct. Others may have had a much wider change. So some examples of the way that words can change and meanings can change, which we'll see throughout the semester. A word like Vesper in Latin, which meant evening, is the source for our Germanic word for something like West. Um, so the idea of West being where the sun is setting. So this is a shift relating to the meaning of that. So you're sort of taking an analogy of where the sun is setting, comparing that with the time of day, evening. And so the word for evening became the word for West because that was where the sun would set during that period of time. We also see examples of Indo-European, the root that means bone or teeth, is where we get the Germanic word for comb. So it sort of expands the, the semantic meaning to go from one bone or one tooth to you thinking of several teeth that you might find in a comb. And then even within other Germanic languages, the Gothic word for letter of the alphabet, boca, um, is related to the German word buch or English book. So this sort of extends the idea of a written element, in this case a letter of the alphabet, into an entire work or an entire compilation of those different letters until you get to something as large as a book. So that covers a lot of the social aspects that we know, as well as a lot of the grammatical pieces that we know about Indo-European and Common Germanic. Um, in the next lecture, we'll talk about the phonological aspects of it. But as always, if you have questions, email me, schedule office hours, bring questions to class. I expect that there will probably be more so in this lecture than what we've had previously because we're starting to dive into some of the more heavy linguistic aspects of these different language changes. So please bring any questions you have and we'll be able to discuss them together.